Jeremy is a graduate of Paris Bible College, and we are absolutely delighted to share with you. Thank you so much, Pastor. How are you guys? Right. You guys doing well? Yeah. Feeling good? You guys ready to receive from the Word this evening? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah? yeah, you guys hungry? Yeah. Okay. Well, I know we've been standing for a little while um, during worship, but would you guys be willing to stand up with me for just a moment? Um, and we're just going to acknowledge the Lord's presence here, and just, uh, I'd encourage you guys as, as we're praying, just from your own heart, from your own mouth, if you want to raise your hands, you just want to express your love to the Lord, just any way that you see fit, just tell Him how much you love Him. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you that your love is unfailing, that you never let go of us, that you never give up on us, that there's not a hopeless case in your kingdom, there's not a hopeless case on this world, that you love us with an unfailing love, that you're completely and totally 100% after our hearts tonight. And um, help us to be open, that if there's anything in our hearts where we would be hard towards you, or we would block uh, what you're trying to say to us, um, help us to be soft, to have soft, tender, responsive hearts this evening to what your word is saying. We love you so much. Thank you for being here with us, Holy Spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and sit down. Thanks for doing that with me. <laughs> you can't worship Jesus too much, can you? <laughs> Never. Um, if you'd like to, go ahead and open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. And just read two verses here, 26 and 27. And um, a good, maybe a good portion of what I'm going to share tonight may seem super foundational. And maybe some things that you think, oh, I've heard this. I've heard this over and over and over and over again. I've been in church for 15 years. I've heard this. Um, if you think you've heard this, I encourage you, let's hear it again. Let's hear it new. Let's hear it fresh. The Word of God is living and active. And amen. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Um, it is completely alive. And we can get something new and fresh out of it that we need right now in our lives. Amen. Every time we open it up. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So man's original purpose in the very beginning, with Adam and Eve, is God said, I'm going to make a creature after my own kind. That male and female, I'm going to make them, and you are to look like me. You know, it says that he made them uh, in, in his likeness. That's what man was meant to look like. Man was, was made in the image of God. We were meant to look like God, because, you know, he's, he's our daddy. You ever see a little kid running around with their mom and their dad, and you think, man, that little girl looks just like her mom, or that little boy looks just like her daddy. That's the way that we were created to be. And unfortunately, through the fall of man, when, you know, they ate the tree from the tree in the garden, when man sinned, uh, it says that they died spiritually on that day. What died in them? The image of God is what died on the inside of them. And we're disconnected from God. But man's original purpose was to look like God. If you guys would look at Romans 8.29 with me. Um, and it says... For those whom he foreknew, talking about God, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Some translations of this make a little bit more sense to me. It seems a little bit wordy sometimes um, when you read it in the NASB. But avert, there's a version of this that says um, God's original purpose for us was that we would look like Jesus, that we would look like his son. Would you guys agree that's what God intended for us? as male and female, human beings, for us to look like Jesus Christ, his son. And I want to show you guys some people in the word of God that I think uh, looked very much like Jesus. <laughs> if you guys would turn to Acts 28 with me, we're going to start in verse 3 there. Just read a little bit of a story here about a guy named Apostle Paul. You guys love the Apostle Paul? Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. So starting in verse 3. It says, but when Paul had, uh, I'll give you a little background, I'm sorry. Um, they have just been shipwrecked on an island. Uh, God has saved them from a storm, but they are shipwrecked and they're stranded on this island with this random people group that they've never met before. And it says, but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. 
And when the natives saw that the creature, the creature was hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly, this man is a murderer, and though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he just shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. So that looks like something Jesus would do. Something, something bad happens to you, the snake bites you, ha, no problem. <laughs> I belong to God. No problem. He just shakes it off. It doesn't say that he stood there and rebuked the devil for five minutes. It said he just shook it off, didn't pay it in any mind. And it says that the people were expecting him to die, but when he didn't, they began to say that he was a god. You know, they, they didn't know any better, but all they knew is that they saw something supernatural in Paul. They saw something beyond uh, just being human. And keep reading the story. It says in verse 7, Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius? I don't know if that's how you say it. But who welcomed us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed, afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery? I don't know all these fancy words, guys. How do you say it? Dysentery. Got it. Thank you, guys. Y'all are awesome. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. And after this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. That sounds like Jesus. Doesn't it? Crowds of people coming to this one guy because he, he, this one guy had had an encounter with Jesus and chose to believe. Amen? That, that looks like Jesus to me. Um, I want to show you guys another story. If you would go with me to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 14, and we're going to start at verse 8. Looking at the Apostle Paul again. It says, at Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he le leapt up or leaped up and began to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in that language, the gods have become like men and they have come down to us. And it continues on to say that they tried to offer sacrifice and they tried to praise Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas said, no, don't do this. Only worship God. The glory belongs to God. God has healed this man. But again, another time where these, these people who really hadn't experienced too much of the supernatural apparently saw what Paul was doing, curing the sick, healing the sick, comforting the oppressed, coming to the rescue of the poor. And they said, there's, there's just something supernatural about this guy. There's something different about the way that this guy lives life. And just from these two stories, would you say that the Apostle Paul was someone who looked like Jesus? Yeah. And I want to say, you know what? If you've chosen to believe in Jesus as your Lord, you look like him on the inside. It says in the book of Ezekiel that when you come to him and you believe and you confess with your mouth that he gives you a new heart and he gives you a new spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man be in Christ, if any man believe in him, he is a brand new creation. Every old thing in your life has passed away and everything has been made new in him. That's your identity. You're a new creature. You're not an old sinner. You are a new creature founded in Christ, rooted in Christ Jesus. Amen? Would you agree that that, would you raise your hand and say, that's me. I am a new creature. I'm created in Christ Jesus. So you know what? On the inside, you look exactly like Jesus in your spirit. You look just like him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, whoever joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Would you guys agree? You're one spirit with Jesus Christ. You have his spirit dwelling on the inside of you. And, you know, we see this in Paul. We can see it very much outwardly in Paul's life that he was acting on the power of God living on the inside of him. And... There is something, and it's going to seem so simple, and it's going to seem like maybe you've heard it over and over again, but I want you to hear it again. So the Lord has really been speaking to me about this. Go to Philippians chapter 3. If there's somebody like the Apostle Paul that I see who looks like Jesus and is walking like Jesus and has just relationship with God like that, I, I want to pay attention to what they have to say, you know, especially if it's in the Word of God. So go to chapter 3 in Philippians, and we're going to look at verse 7 and... Probably go to verse 9. Sounds good. 
This is Paul writing. And he's just listed off a whole bunch of uh, earthly credentials that he's had growing up. You know, when Stephen Katz was here this morning, um, you know, Paul was raised in that kind of environment that those Jews that he talked about and very strict, very uptight, very much letter of the law, rule by rule. That's the way Paul was raised. And he lists off all these things. He's, you know, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I knew the law like nobody else. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was from this particular tribe of people of Jews. And then this is what he says. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things. What things? All, all things. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, some versions say dung or poop, so that I may gain Christ. Why did he count all, every other thing to be lost in comparison to? Simply knowing Jesus. He said, I've counted every other thing as a loss in my life. If I don't know Jesus, I've missed the point of life. If I do not know Jesus, and it's not just knowing, he didn't say knowing about Jesus. He didn't say, I count all things as lost in the surpassing value of knowing about Jesus. He said, knowing him. Personally, I'm sh I assume that you, you, uh, all of you have at least one family member or one friend that you know very well, that you spend a lot of time with them, you know their likes, you know their dislikes, um, you can finish some of their sentences before they finish them, right? I assume most of you guys have someone like that in your life. That's the way that God wants to be with us. Yeah. He's, he's not just Lord, he is also friend. Jesus said, no longer do I call you slaves, but I call you my friends if you do what I command you. You know, we find out something the Lord said to me a while back was, um, in Jesus, you find both lordship and friendship. You find both of those things in that one person in Jesus Christ, lordship and friendship. And Paul said, this is the one, I gave up everything else. I count everything else to be lost in view of just knowing Jesus, just knowing him intimately. If you think about what was Adam and Eve's purpose in the garden, there was nobody to pray for because no one was sick. Um... There was no one to encourage because there was no one who was discouraged. Um, there were no bills to worry about. Uh, there was no evil thing <laughs> walking around distracting them. What does it say that they did? They just took care of the garden and fellowship with God and talked with him. That was man's original purpose, to know God, yeah. to know him as father, to know him as friend. And I'd venture to say, we're going to look at this more tonight, but I'd venture to say that any, any person, any Christian that you see um, living a lifestyle that looks like Jesus, where they're successful, where they do have miracles working in their life, um, where, you know, they seem to know the word very, very well. Any Christian that you just look at them, you go, man, they're just, a, they look like Jesus. They're Jesus to me. <laughs> you know, they look like him. I venture to say that that person, the reason they are that way is because they have a deep relationship with their Savior. They yeah. know Him. They've spent time with Him. Um, they spent time in His presence. they spent time getting to know Him. You know, this, this Bible right here is one of the most valuable earthly things that you will ever possess or you will ever own. And it's because it tells you about Jesus. It, it's, it's one of the most important ways that we can get to know Him. And the book of Joshua, it says, don't let the words of this Bible leave your mouth or leave your mind. Meditate on them day and night. What does that mean? That you just sit there with your Bible and your nose in your Bible all day? No. Meditate. It means think about it. Throughout your day, think about the scriptures that you've heard in church. Think about the scriptures that you've read in your morning devotion time. Just think about it. Let it roll around in your mind. You know, maybe mutter it under your breath. Whatever you can to do to keep your mind um, on what the Word of God says. And uh, it says that because it says, um, careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. The book of John says that Jesus is the Word made flesh, that Jesus and the Word are equals, right? When you know this Word, when you know Jesus intimately, that is when you have reached great success. You know, if um, there's, uh, when I went to college, um, one of the uh, men of God that I respect that I got to hear talk a lot was Andrew Womack. Um, and he shared something one time that just blew me away, that just totally started changing my thinking. 
And you know, he's, he's on TV, he potentially reaches three billion people a day through his television program. He gets to travel all over the world and pray for people and teach the word of God and just for testimony after testimony of people's lives who've been changed um, because he's given his life to the Lord. But he said something one time, he said, you know what? If I was doing all these things, if I was traveling the world, if I was preaching the gospel every day of my life, I was just living and breathing the gospel, I was reaching three billion people a day and yet I didn't know Jesus intimately. I didn't have time to sit down with him and talk, to have coffee with him, to get to know his heart, to hear his voice. He said, I would have missed it. If I reached billions of people for the sake of the gospel, and yet I did not know him deeply, I missed the point of life. I missed the point of life. Jesus said um, in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that you know me and you know the Father who has sent me. That's eternal life. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not all about going to heaven, guys. Heaven is awesome. I love the thought of when I die, I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus forever. But you know what? Heaven wants to get into you today. It's not all about going to heaven. It's about heaven getting into you on this earth. Because you know what? There, there are people who need to see what Jesus looked like. There are people who will never step into a church. But you know what? They'll, they'll come across you on the street. They'll come across you at work. They'll, they'll bump into you anywhere. And you know what? They need to see what Jesus looks like. Your, your identity is to look like Jesus. You're a new creation. You're a new creature. And um, I want to share with you something that um, while we were in Mexico, something that I wrote down that the Lord, um, I'll, just, I'll just talk about it, I guess. I don't know how to really describe what it was. Um, but we, were, we had like a, a six-hour car ride one day, and I just... You know, you had six hours sitting in one seat. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, I was like, well, I'll just open my Bible and try to spend a little bit of time with the Lord, get to know him better, talk to him a little bit. So I put some worship music on my earbuds, open up my Bible, and I just wasn't, just wasn't connecting. I was not feeling it, okay? <laughs> you get that term, you know, you ever open your Bible and you're just like, eh, I'm not feeling it. You know, I love Jesus, but I'm just not feeling it today. And I was just having one of those days, and I'm just thinking like, man, Lord, what's wrong? I don't know what's wrong. Just I feel blah. And he said, you're trying to be accepted. I'm like, what? He said, you're trying to be accepted. And I was like, I don't think I am. He said, in this moment, you were trying to, to get yourself worked up about me, get yourself excited about me. You're trying to make yourself acceptable in my sight. I've already made you acceptable. Yeah. You're already acceptable to me. And that goes for you guys. The reason I share that portion of the story before the rest is because the blood of Jesus has cleansed us of all sin, the Bible says that you're not an old, dirty sinner. You're free. Amen. You're dead to sin. Romans 6 says over and over again, you're free from sin. You're free from the power of sin and death. Christ rules in your life if you will let him, if you'll believe, if you'll put your trust on that. He will rule in your life. So I was like, okay. And the Lord is like, just, just sit there. Don't try to do anything. Just rest and relish in the fact that you're accepted, that I've accepted you. Um, we, we need to read this really quick. Hebrews chapter 10. So you can lay your eyes on this. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. Before we continue. And it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, by what? By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he has inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. It says, by the blood of Jesus, you can walk right up to the throne room Walk right in up to the throne, not in shame, not in fear, not in guilt. What does it say? In confidence, yeah. in boldness. Not because of what you've done, not because of you tried super hard to make yourself acceptable and pleasing to God, but simply because you believed in the blood shed for you on the cross and that blood cleansed you. In your sight, you were perfect in his sight. When you walk up to the throne, you were perfect in the sight of God. He doesn't see any blemish on you. The Bible says that you've been made holy and blameless in the sight of God. And this is what Hebrews is talking about. By the blood of Jesus, we have confidence to enter the throne 
rule of God. And as I was just thinking about the scriptures, I was sitting in the car just thinking about, you know what, as Christians, we're accepted by God. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. And I just started to think about this. We have boldness to enter the holy place, boldness to enter the throne room. And I just, I don't know if you would call it a vision or you call it my imagination, or have you ever just had, just, it felt like a video clip was being played in your mind, you know, just like, felt like maybe the Lord was showing you something or you were remembering something. I was still there in the car. I was still seeing with my eyes everything in the car, but in my mind, I just saw myself next to my father in what I believe looked like the throne room and just sitting there in, in the car, I was kind of snuggled up against the side of the window. And I just saw myself sitting on my daddy's lap in heaven, just snuggled up next to him. Just close, personal, intimate. Some people might think that sounds weird, but <laughs> I was loving it. And I just saw myself just close to him, intimate with him. And that he wasn't mad, he wasn't upset, he wasn't angry with me. He was pleased that I was there. He was pleased to spend time with me. And I just, I don't remember everything that was done or everything was that was said, but I remember him just as I was sitting there talking with me, saying things to build me up, to encourage me, just being sweeter and kinder than anybody I've ever known in my life. I don't remember everything that he said or all the details, but what I remember is just him being kind, just incredibly kind. And just sitting with there, letting him love on me, me loving on him back and talking with me, us having fun together, him encouraging me. And I just, the, the, just, the imagination of the clip in my head didn't last a whole long time, but in, it felt like that went on for a long time, if that makes sense. Like what I was watching went on for a good period of time. Like I'd been there for a long time. And this is the part that I remember clearly that he said. And he just put his head down and just whispered in my ear, after all this, after just spending so much time in his presence, just so much time with him, he just says, now go. Tell them about me. Tell them who I am. Show them who I am. And it wasn't go in the sense of leave my presence because his presence is always with us. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 13.5 says he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. He never leaves us. But in this sense, he's saying, go into all the world. Tell them who I am. Show them who I am. And I was thinking, man, how am I going to do that? And then I realized the whole, the whole picture of being in the throne room, the whole picture of sitting on his lap and spending time with him and just being with him, learning who he is and letting him show us who he is. That's what makes us able to go and show him to the world. You know, sometimes we can try to be very evangelistic with the way that we go and reach people and we try to kind of force ourselves to preach the gospel. We try, it's, I don't know a better way to say it, but we try to force ourselves to preach the gospel. We try to force it and squeeze it out of us. And I believe what God really wants is for us to look like Jesus. You know, sometimes Jesus didn't say a word and yet people were drawn to him. Sometimes he didn't say a word and people just came to him and said, what must I do to be saved? You know, people would just randomly walk up to him and say things like that. And I know he had a reputation for doing miracles and teaching, but there were times where people would just come to him and he hasn't said a word. He wasn't forcing something down their throats, you know? And I believe this is what God has for us, that you don't see a tree out in the field an apple tree struggling to produce apples, you know? You don't see a tree out there like, I got one, you know? You don't, you don't see that happen. If the, if the seed is good, if the ground is good, it's rooted well, it's going to create apples. It's going to make apples. You know what? If we're rooted in Jesus, if we're rooted in Christ, if we're really getting to know him and letting him get to know us, it won't have to be a struggle for us to show the world what Jesus looks like. You'll simply be out at the grocery store and the Lord will say, hey, say this to that woman. Ask her about this, you know? And it might be something random, something totally off the wall that you think, I can't know that. You know, because you've been with him, because you've spent time with him, it just comes naturally, you know? And that might sound like a really far stretch for, for some people who might be thinking, come natural to me. It's really hard for me. 
I, I would say to you, spend more time with him. And that doesn't mean that you're in your prayer closet 24-7. That doesn't mean that you need to be in your prayer closet five hours or sitting at your desk reading this for five hours. But acknowledge him throughout your day. When you're, when you're sitting at home in the morning drinking your coffee, just acknowledge that he's there. Talk with him. You know, when you're at work, um, don't think it a weird thing that he's sitting there with you. <laughs> that his presence is as much there as it is here with us. Amen? And just throughout your day, acknowledge him. Ask him questions. You know, I found that that's a really powerful thing to ask the Lord questions. Because you know what? If you listen, he'll answer. You know, some of us, I think, are afraid to ask questions because we're afraid we'll be embarrassed when we don't hear anything back. But, you know, if you really listen, when we get to know him, you ask questions, he'll answer you. And if it's something that you're not supposed to know about yet, no biggie, he'll tell you that, you know? But I believe the way that we get to the place where it's not a struggle for the world to see Jesus in us, where if someone does you wrong, it's not a, oh my gosh, I'm so having so much trouble to forgive right now, and I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on a nice face. I am going to be nice to them. I am going to be nice to them. I'm going to put on a nice face, and you walk out, hey, how's it going? But on the inside, you're still mad at them. Where it doesn't have to be like that, but your first reaction is just, man, God loves them. They must be having a bay, a, a, bay, a bad day. <laughs> they must be having a bad day for them to treat me like that. You know, there must be something going on in their life that I don't know about that has hurt them, and that's why they treat me that way. You know, God help them. God, open up the eyes of their heart to see you. You know, where our reaction is, is love instead of trying to be love. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Where our first reaction is you know, the old phrase, what would Jesus do? Gets so tired and worn out, but we can get to a place where in our lives, we're not asking what would Jesus do anymore, but we're seeing clearly, ah, this is what Jesus looks like. This is what Jesus would do in this situation. Where we're not trying to be Christians. You know, the word Christian means little Christ. People that, you know, mm, sounds funny, but like little versions of Jesus. <laughs> little Jesus is running around the world. People who look like him on the inside. That's what Christian means. You know, where we're not trying to be Christians, but because we've given our lives to him, we've surrendered our lives to him, and we're getting to know him, that we just, we do. We look like him. We're not trying, but we're just being. And uh, I'm so sorry if this has sounded like a beat you over the head message because if it came out that way, that's not the way I meant this to sound. You know what? God loves you. He likes being with you. Do you know that? There was... Um, not this past two weeks that we've been in Mexico, but back in August when we went to Mexico, we were at a church and people were all around the altar and we were praying for people. And um, in Mexico, sometimes they have a, a, just a religious tradition of when they come to the altar, they'll just kind of flail and scream and they think it's because they're experiencing the power of God and they're trying to worship Him. They're trying to worship God in the best way they know how. And so they come to the altar in fear. And so they'll just scream in what sounds like screaming in terror. And before when I've experienced that, I've kind of like, I didn't like it, but I didn't quite know what to do about it. I kind of let other people handle that, you know. But in August when we were there, we were praying for somebody, and just across the room there was this, this girl that just started screaming. And it wasn't a scream of joy, it was a scream of terror. And I, I, it, was, it was a very different experience. All of a sudden, I just opened my eyes and I was like, I know what to do. She's in trouble. Like, that was my first thought was, this girl's in trouble. This girl doesn't know who she is. This girl... Doesn't, doesn't know who God has created her to be. This girl doesn't know the love of God. So we finished praying for this person, and we just went over there, and she's down on her knees just screaming and crying. And long story short, we just start talking to her about the love of God. And one of the things that I do remember that we said was, we told her, like, you know, we asked her at first, you know, why are you screaming? She says, it's the power of God. You know, I'm trying to worship God and all these things. He said, you know, he likes being with you, don't you? He likes, the Holy Spirit likes you. And this little girl just kind of stopped trembling, and she kind of looked up with big saucer eyes, and she just looked at us like she never heard that before in her whole life. No one had ever told her that God didn't just love her, but liked her. You know, we get this idea of God will do what's best for us, and we kind of are cynical against that. God's going to do what's best for me. He also likes you. He, well, if he didn't like you, why would he send his son? If he didn't enjoy your presence, why throughout all of history would he spend time over and over again that when we messed up so bad that he would do something to bring us back to a place of fellowship with him? He likes you. He likes being with you. He likes you. He likes me. And, man, when we realize that and we start spending time 
with him getting to know him, and not from a place of obligation where I guess I have to open up my Bible now because I'm a Christian, or I guess I need to spend some time talking to the one who saved me, but it's, wow, he loves me so much. How could someone love me that much? Man, I want to get to know this person. If I was made to look like him, man, so be it. Jesus, make me look like you. And as you spend time in his presence, as you spend time getting to know him, the Bible says that you will be transformed. I want you to look at a scripture with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Real quick, verse 17, I'm sorry. Verse 17 says, um, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or there is freedom. Where God's Spirit is, there is freedom. Where is God's Spirit? In us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We're one with Him. There's freedom on the inside of you. Where His Spirit dwells, it says there's freedom. You keep reading. You have freedom. It belongs to you. It says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. This verse essentially is saying, as you look at Jesus, as you continue to look at him, as you continue to get to know him, as you continue to behold his glory, it says that you are what? Transformed. In the same image. And I love how it says looking at him as in a mirror. That when you look at Christ, he wants to be a mirror for you. When you look at him, that you don't just see this high and lofty Lord of the universe up on his throne, but when you look at him, you see someone who lives in you. Yeah. You see, man, that's what I was created to be. Yeah. Not that you were created to be Lord of the universe, but you were created to look like Jesus. Yeah. Even here on this earth, before we reach heaven, before we die. And it says that as you continue looking at Jesus, as you continue looking at him as in a mirror, you are transformed into what? The same image. You go back to the garden, to what God created you to look like. Created in his likeness, created in his image. And you look like him not just on the inside, but it shows on the outside. Amen. You're transformed into the same image going from glory to glory. It means that it's, it is going to be incremental on this earth. The more you get to know him, the more glorious it gets. Man, guys, this is what God has, has made us for. And I didn't finish reading what he spoke to me that day, so I'm going to finish reading that. But I just want you, want you to, to think of what I'm going to read next in light of that, that we're transformed by looking at Jesus. Um, the Lord just continued to, to say to me, um, after saying, you know, now go, tell them about me, tell them who I am, show them who I am. He said, there are billions of people who never spend time in my presence. I'm available and willing and longing to fellowship with every person, but many are completely unaware of it, or they have rejected me totally because they think they know who I am. They think I'm the bad guy. They've been lied to. But what if they ran into someone who's been with me? What if they ran into love in the flesh? What if they talked with someone who's met and spent time with the real Jesus, who carries him with them everywhere they go? who don't leave him at church or at home in their bedroom or in their prayer closet because his spirit goes with us everywhere we go. Most of us have probably had the thought before, why can't Jesus just come down and walk the earth again? That would be so awesome. Well, what if people could see the love of God in the flesh again through you? Yeah. We've got to stop getting caught up in what other people have said about or done to us and rest, relax, and trust in what God has said about us, about what he has done for us. His thoughts and words about you will always be higher than anyone else's. We can get to a place where we aren't annoyed, angry, and upset with people, but reacting that way actually becomes laughable to us. We can get to a place of grace where we can truly and rightly say and believe along with our Father, no matter what you do to me, I'll never stop loving you. That's what changes people. The love and the kindness of God when they have done everything that they can to rebel against him. Amen? Amen? And how, how do we get there? How do we get to the place where we're not trying to be Christians, but we're simply being who God has created us to be? It's by getting to know Him. Simply walking with Him day by day, getting to know His goodness, getting to know His grace. 
and receiving how much he loves us. That trips so many Christians up, and has tripped me up included very much before. Just receiving the simple fact that he loves me, period. End of sentence, end of story, he loves me. And that's the same story for you. He loves you, period. End of sentence, end of story, conversation is done as far as God is concerned. He loves you. He likes you, and he's done everything that he can within his power to get to know you, to make you right in his sight. So that you can have a relationship with him, so you can have fellowship with him. And um, I just encourage us all this evening um, that from this message, please don't take away the thought of, I'm going to go home and I'm going to promise the Lord every day I'm going to spend two hours in the Word and I'm going to spend two hours in prayer. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is live with Him. Invite Him into your day. Yes, spend time in the Word. Spend time just sitting down with Him and you alone in the Word, just talking with Him with no one else around. But at the same time, be aware of His presence throughout your day. And if you forget He's there, hey, no biggie as far as He's concerned. He's very merciful. He's very kind. If you forget he's there, he's just a thought away. He's right there. Just remember it. Just pick it back up and get say, hey, thanks for being with me, Holy Spirit. Thanks for being here with me. And as we live in this way, you know what? That's, that's when we reach the world. That is actually when we start affecting the world with the gospel. We're not forcing it down people's throats. We're not trying to be Christians to prove something to the world. But we are simply being who God has created us to be because we know him. That's when the dead are raised. That's when miracles happen. That's when the blind see. That's when more people than we've ever seen before come to Christ because they see him. Amen? Amen. Amen. I think that's everything. Can we, can we all stand together at the end here? Um, and if you'd say that tonight, that is my heart cry. I just want to know God better because you know what? I, I do want to live the life that he's had planned for me. The life that he's had planned for you is 100% better than anything you've had planned for yourself. Guaranteed. It's not boring. It's not a drag. When you really get to know him, it's exciting. It's the best thing you've ever experienced in your whole life, giving yourself to him and saying, I'm not my own anymore. I belong to you. Do with me whatever you'd like to do. I'm yours. There is a joy found in that where it's not scary anymore, but because you know that he loves you, it's a joy to follow him. And please take anything else away. I don't say any of these things from a place of living them in perfection. Amen. None of us can say any of these things from living in a place of perfection. But I can, I can say this because I've experienced pieces of this in my life and blocks of this in my life. And because the word says it. <laughs> because this Bible, this truth says it. And I believe what this says more than what I see with my physical eyes. And I encourage you to do the same. Believe what this word says more than what you've seen in your life thus far. Um, so if you want this, if you're saying, you know what, Lord, I just simply want to know you better. I just simply want to know you in the way that you created me to know you. I just encourage you to say out loud, Jesus, Jesus. I want to know you. My life is yours. Teach me who you are. Reveal to my heart more who you are. Help me to experience what I was created to be in the first place. A child of God. A child. Looking just like you. Looking just like you. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for being with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. And Father, I just speak over every person in this room, myself included. Um, that in the coming days we, we will continue to know you more and more every single day. That, um, that each and every day that we're putting ourselves in position to hear your voice, um, to receive more revelation of who you are. Um, and we do love you so much. Thank you for doing all the things, all the great things that you have done so that we can know you. And um, you're just worth it all, Jesus. You are worth every bit of our lives and more. So we just say we're yours. We give ourselves to you. Our lives are not our own. We belong to you. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much for listening. <laughs> I appreciate you all.